I'd like to turn to a term that uh, folks are getting familiar with, which is meaningful use. Uh, it's the adoption and meaningful use of health IT. Uh, first, would you explain for us what it, what it means, meaningful use, and would you elaborate on the three-staged approach you've taken? So meaningful use was actually a brilliant term that was coined in the legislation, the high-tech legislation that created this next phase as part of the stimulus bill. And what it said was that doctors and hospitals can earn these payments uh, not just for buying a software system, but for actually using it in certain ways that are known to be associated with and prerequisites for the outcomes we wish to see. It's defined in regulations, and it says these are what these are the things you have to do in order to qualify for the incentive payments. I'll give you an example. It turns out blood pressure control, right? Only about half the time patients with high blood pressure have the blood pressure controlled. If we do a better job of that, we can save the most lives of anything. We basically say you got to be able to have quality measurement, decision support, registry functions, and you need to have all the data elements that go into doing those things. You have to have the blood pressure and the medications and the vital signs and the smoking status and so forth. Well, that's basically halfway to meaningful use, right? You got to be able to do those things, you're halfway to meaningful use. Then the next thing we want to, to providers to do and what they want to do is not kill people. So what kills people? Well, let's start with medication safety. A couple hundred thousand adverse events, deaths a year from medication errors. Well, now we're 80% of the way to what people have to do to become meaningful users and so on. So meaningful use takes the goals and it says these are the behaviors that are associated with doing that. We understand you can't get there in one leap, right? And we want the most number of people to begin this massive change operation. And so we said, and the legislation permitted, doing it in stages. Stage one, start collecting the data, get your, get your feet wet. Stage two is a real push on data interoperability and exchanging information. Stage three, we've said aspiration is going to be about more and more about outcomes, not checking the box on this or that or collecting data uh, or even uh, getting to good processes. It's really after you've been doing it for four or five years, it's now to step up to outcomes. So that's kind of the staged approach that we're thinking for meaningful use. So what are some of the uh, barriers you've, uh, you've faced uh, that you've seen in the uh, recent ad uh, trying to adopt, implement, and, and achieve meaningful use? And how have you used the lessons learned from those barriers to influence your path forward? One barrier is change is hard. <laughs> change is really hard. And this is a big change in how we do work. And it's not very well fit to the reimbursement of today, which uh, mm -hmm. values, you know, seeing more and more and more patients with less and less time. Uh, so the problems that you run into there are, one, there's a lot of providers who really need to uh, need a helping hand to be able to implement this effectively and to optimize the technology, because just putting it in is the first step, and really it's the optimization uh, that is so critical to getting to the outcome. So I can talk more about the regional health IT extension centers and the important work uh, that they've done. Another challenge comes around the usability of the systems. Mm -hmm. And a lot of uh, providers and, and a lot of us in nowadays have gotten used to software uh, and hardware that work together in very intuitive ways. And then interoperability, as I mentioned, having the systems talk to each other is critical. I think those are some of the challenges, and there's many, many more, but some of the main challenges that we are taking, I think, good positive steps in resolving, but this is not going to be an easy or a short journey. So, Doctor, you're not doing this necessarily alone. Um, the High Tech Act uh, called for the creation and establishment of, the federal, of two federal advisory committees. Sure. I'd like to talk about them. What's their mission, and can you tell me how you interact with them, yeah. and what's their accomplishments to date? Uh, this has been actually one of the most interesting parts of running this process. So these committee, the policy committee in particular, was explicitly created to represent these broad stakeholder viewpoints, the general, uh, the government accountability office points, the majority of them, the house minority and majority leaders, the Senate, the majority and minority leaders also appoint their representatives to the committee in certain roles. And the committee, the policy committee gives us, gives me and then the secretary recommendations on how the policies should be aligned. And the standards committee really tells us what are the national standards that are needed to move us forward on interoperability. 
And when the opportunity came uh, with the high-tech legislation, we expanded that nationwide. And we now have, and this is really a kind of a breathtaking, breathtaking statistic I hope your listeners will appreciate. I think it's the largest medical technical assistance project in history. 140,000 primary care docs in America have gotten assistance. And the GAO found that they're 2.3 times as likely to get to meaningful use. And these are in some of the toughest places to go to. We went to the smallest practices. We went to the poorest counties. We went to the most rural areas, the critical access hospitals. And uh, there is now a regional health IT extension center in, that is there for every part of the United States and territories. And they've been really amazing examples of how with federal support and convening, but local knowledge, local resources, we can make big, big things happen. 